I'm hurrying, running even, through the busy street, my cloak streaming out behind me in the morning breeze. People's heads turn to see a woman of my age running. How undignified, they must be thinking. What does she think she looks like, this woman beaming from ear to ear? yet with streaks of tears still visible all over her face. This woman whose unkempt hair and darkly shadowed eyes speak of mourning and who yet seems full of energy and life. Normally, I keep to the quiet shadows, sure that my shame will show on my face, that everyone who looks at me will know who I am, what I am. But today, there's a message I need to deliver, and it just can't wait. Around me, the city teems with life. People going off to market, off to buy bread, stopping to chat, leading livestock up to pasture. All these people going about their ordinary, everyday activities, totally unaware that today the world has changed forever. Part of me wants to shout my message to the street, to blurt it out there and then to everybody. But he told me to go to his brothers, to Peter, John and the others. That's the task he gave me. That's the job that only I can do. And I know it's important that I do it exactly as he asked of me. So amid the busyness of the morning rush hour, I cherish my message within my heart, that message more valuable than the most expensive pearl, that tiny seed waiting to burst forth into glorious blossom. And I continue to run, intent upon reaching the small upper room, our place of refuge, our headquarters in this time of crisis. Nobody stirred when I crept from my cramped corner early this morning, even before it was light. I had to go, to get out of the dark, stuffy room, away from the heaviness of our collective guilt and grief, the endless circular conversations. I had to go and be near him, or at least all that was left of him. As I made my way through the deserted streets, the sorrow and pain of the last few days was overwhelming. I'd been there through all of it. I'd witnessed the flogging, made myself keep watching, hoping that somehow my steady gaze would be a comfort to him, even as they kept on beating his bruised, bleeding body. I'd seen them place a purple robe on him, mock him, slap him, force a crown of thorns upon his head, and then drag him out before the governor for sentencing. I'd watched through my fingers, my hands over my ears to block out the baying crowd shouting crucify as Pilate pronounced his fate. As the rest ran away and fled, I even followed to Golgotha, that cursed place, to stand at the foot of the cross as Jesus died in agony as the blood drained from his lifeless face, as the skies went dark and with his final breath he gasped, it is finished. And with that, it was finished, all over. My hopes, my dreams, my love, everything I had to live for. Yet still I followed as Joseph and Nicodemus, those rich men, took down his body and anointed it with spices, wrapped it gently in new linen and laid it in a tomb, rolling a heavy stone across the entrance. 
in the endless hours of Sabbath, in the long, dark, sleepless nights, the image of his broken body, his eyes huge in his tortured face, burnt upon my mind. Yes, I had to get out, go to the tomb, be near my Lord, even as my Lord lay dead. But when I arrived, the tomb looked different. I stood for a moment, stupid with grief, exhaustion and confusion, unable to comprehend. Then I turned on my heel and ran as fast as I could back to the others, forgetting to hide in the shadows. I went to Peter, sobbing and breathless, and exclaimed, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and I don't know where they've put him. I collapsed onto the floor, weeping. But Peter and John, they pulled me roughly to my feet again. They needed me to show them the way to the tomb. And so we were running again, racing to get to the tomb. John ran ahead of us. He reached the tomb and looked inside, stunned. Then Peter pushed him aside to get into the tomb itself. John entered more slowly. I could hear them talking to each other in low voices ignoring me now that I'd done what they needed. They emerged white-faced and departed without a word to me. I no longer had the energy to follow them. I just stood there by the tomb, the tears flowing freely. Then something, I don't know what, made me bend down, look inside the tomb. And inside were two men, dressed in the brightest white, their faces shining. For a moment I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me. Then one of them spoke. Woman, why are you weeping? In a faltering voice I started to explain. They've taken away my Lord and I don't know where they've put him. I turned and saw a man standing there. Through the tears, I didn't see his face clearly, but when he spoke, his voice was gentle. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Perhaps, I thought, perhaps he could help me. Are you the gardener? I asked. Have you taken him? Please, if you have, tell me. I'll go and find him. Mary, said the stranger, cutting in on my babbling. He knew. He knew my name. And in that moment, I knew too. I didn't know how I knew or how it could have happened, but I just knew it was him. He wasn't in the tomb because he was right beside me in the garden. Rabuni, I said, my teacher. And then I knelt before him, still weeping, but now with tears of rejoicing and laughter, mingling with the shock and grief. And I threw my arms around him, a thousand questions forming in my mind that I just couldn't put into words. It really was him, actual, real, physical, and solid, standing there as the risen sun's rays filled the garden with light and the birds sang for joy. And when I looked into his face, his eyes were dancing with laughter too. And he was smiling as he gently but firmly disentangled me from him and set me on my feet again. Don't hold on to me, he said, still smiling, but go, go to my brothers, to Peter and the others. Go and tell them that I'm alive and that I'm ascending now to my God and yours. Go on, Mary, tell them. Why me? He knows I like to stay in the corner, in the shadows. He knows I don't like to draw attention to myself. Why me? 
I had thousands, millions of questions. But he was gone almost as soon as he had appeared and he left me with a job to do. And as I hurried through those busy streets, suffused with new warmth and energy, I'm starting to understand all those conversations we had before, all those times he tried to reassure me that my past, everything I've been ashamed of, the things I've done wrong were right there in the past, that he offered the gift of new life. When he said, it is finished on that cross, as he hung dying, that's what was finished. Not my hopes, my dreams, my love, my life, but the pain, the distress, the wrong. My Jesus, my saviour died on that cross for me to set me free from everything in my past that's ever tried to believe that I was worthless or useless, that I would never be any good. And now, because he's alive, I can live a new life too. A life that comes to me as a gift, a life that has meaning and purpose because he loves me and he's given me a job that only I can do. So gathering speed, I turn into our street and clatter up the outside staircase to our upper room. I burst into the room and walk right up to Peter, looking him straight in the eye. And taking a deep, steadying breath, I prepare myself to say out loud the most important sentence of my life. I have seen the Lord. <laughs>